All right. Still have a few folks joining us, but we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, my name is Lauren. I'm the director of events here at Brinka. So thank you so much for joining us today for motorcycles and vulnerability management, why context matters. I'm sure the title alone has piqued your interest. So we're going to have Alex Babar, our VP of solutions, walk you through it. And hopefully this is going to be a useful tool for all of you to bring back to your organization. As a couple of reminders, please participate. We have a couple of fun things throughout the presentation that we'll have you participate in the chat with. Uh, stay on mute as well as be on the lookout for a fun surprise at the end before Q&A. So please stay for the entire presentation. Other than that, thank you all again for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Alex to get started. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, hi to everyone in the chat. Thanks for, for interacting there. Spoiler alert, and I'll call this out when we're ready for it. We're going to do some, some activity in that chat, so keep that bar up. Uh, for, for now, let's go ahead and kick things off. So today's session is about motorcycles and vulnerability management. Like, What, what do, do, to, do these two things have in common? And if your first guess was that the motorcycle rider pictured here was actually a vulnerability management person, that's incorrect. Good try. Uh, the correct answer is actually right here in the slide on the bottom left. It's context matters when evaluating the risk level of both activities. Um, vulnerabilities, how risky are those? Riding a motorcycle, how risky is that? So let's go ahead and get started. Um, one thing I want to say before that, though, is to kind of set the stage for today, I hope you really have two clean takeaways this isn't an analogy just to have fun with it, um, just to make it entertaining, though I hope it does make it fun and entertaining for all of you, especially those that are up early in the morning on the West Coast joining us. Um, it's also because communicating risk to non-security folks is becoming just more and more important these days. So I was in a conversation with a CISO a couple weeks ago. So this is pretty soon after all the SolarWinds news, you know, around the SEC trying to make a case, you know, against the CISO at SolarWinds. And his big takeaway is while he's letting things filter out to really form an opinion, is that it's pretty clear that communicating risk is very important and you need to be thoughtful about how you do that. And what sort of scared him a little bit is it seemed like the SEC was trying to put the onus of communicating risk in a way the non-security person understands it, putting that onus on the security teams. And that's pretty hard. So hence the analogy, right? So I think this is a packaged up way to help you all communicate better with your non-technical, non-security stakeholders. Hopefully communicating this way is not only fun, like I said, but also useful so you could take this with you. With that said, just a little bit about me. Lauren called it out just to kick off. So I'm VP of Solutions here at Brinka. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Brinka, Essentially, what we do is we help enterprises precisely reduce the vulnerabilities that matter. We're not going to get into the technology side of this equation today in today's topic. Just know that Brink is a technology vendor in this space. Really, what we do is we're one SaaS platform that helps you unify, prioritize, remediate, and report on disparate security findings from throughout your attack surface. So if you want to follow up after, learn more about the technology side, feel free to either reach out to me or Brinka and I'll give you some ways to do that easily. For now, we're gonna keep it more focused on motorcycles and vulnerability management. So with that, he, here's where the fun starts, all right? Um, I'm gonna plea to everyone on, on this call that you open up your chat bar and you participate. It's gonna be a pretty low lift, but I've given a version of this presentation in person before at a keynote uh, here in Austin, cybersecurity event. And one of the reasons that this landed so well was the interaction from the audience. But there we could hand raise, we could head nod, everyone could kind of see what everyone was thinking. So I want to recreate that virtually. Um, also, I want to prove that virtual events can be as good as real in-person events. And so that's why we have secret, secret at the end. We've got this interactivity up here up front. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask some questions and I'm going to not poll in the formal sense, but just open it up to the comments, like put in a yes, no, put in the answer to this question here so that everyone could actually look and see uh, the responses just kind of in a stream of consciousness way from the audience as a whole. All right. I see a lot of hellos here. So we know, I know we know how to use the chat. Thank you, everybody. So I'll call it out when we're ready to answer some questions. First of all, does anyone actually know who this is pictured? 
You can put in the chat. You just think out loud. I didn't know when I first saw this picture, um, someone someone that knew I was doing this presentation gave, gave me the heads up this picture existed. So this is actually Steve Jobs. <laughs> someone just got it right. Perfect timing. So this is actually Steve Jobs riding a motorcycle. Uh, to me, the picture, the reason the picture really resonates, I don't, I don't know if there's a reason that it resonates with you all or if it does, but he's not wearing a helmet. It's, it's weird, right? Motorcycles are risky activity. This is Steve Jobs, very, very important man. Uh, no helmet. Oh, no gloves, no jacket. We have some eagle eyes here in the audience, right? So that that's great. So here's the question. Look at the picture. Here's the question. Is this risky? So go into the chat. If you think it's risky, just simple, put a yes. If you think it's not risky, simple, put a no. You got some yeses. I'll give this maybe 15 seconds. We can kind of see what's happening. You got some no's, got some yeses. Got, got a maybe. There's not enough context to the side. Smiley face. Someone knows where I'm going with this. So, so it was a trick question. I was trying to trick you guys early in the morning um, before you got on to me. Um, yeah, that's the wrong question. Is it risky? So we see a couple things. And when I present this before, we see there's, I think most people think this is risky. Um, not everyone does. And there's some reasons that folks think that. So it kind of illustrates that risk is a little bit subjective. It could be risky, it could not be risky, or maybe I just need to know more. So let's go down that path. How risky is it, I think is a better question, right? And so we're, we're all security folks here. Let's, let's score this. Let's score this on a scale of one to 10. One is the lowest risk possible, 10 is maximum risk. So I'm gonna change the question a little bit. If, if you think this is a one to five risky, go ahead and type in low right now. I got some some yeses. I'm going to count those as lows. Okay, we got some lows. All right, and feel free to keep going if you're on the low, but you haven't gotten in there. If you think this is a, you know, five to eight, go ahead, type in medium. Or just throw in your number if you want to. You can see where I'm going with this. If you think this is an eight to nine, go ahead and type in high. And you think this is a nine to 10, go ahead and type in critical. All right, so we got a lot of mediums, some highs, decent amount of lows. It's like a couple criticals. And I again, we kind of revalidated something I just said, right? From the yes or no, it, it's a spectrum and it's subjective. There, there's no just like objectively right answer to this question. How risky is it? So where do we end up? I'm going to just summarize like my eyeballing of the answers. And let's call this a medium high risk. Are we done? So I'd say we're not done. Context matters. Let's talk about some specific context. So if we have a base risk score now of medium high, I'm going to ask some questions here. You could participate or not. That's the participation interactive portion of, of the webinar. So thank you so much for participating on that. But how fast is he going? I mean, if he's going 10 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour or 100 miles an hour, wouldn't that change how you felt about how risky this was? Wouldn't that impact your score? I think so. Now, what about the condition of the bike? Let's say he has a bike guy. <laughs> of course, Steve Jobs, right? So he has a bike guy. It's proactively maintained. Tires are always inflated. Bike is in great condition. Would that change the score? Maybe. What if the bike's neglected? Is is a collector's bike, two years old, has been collecting dust. He just needed to get out of the out of the office, get off campus. You know, I think that would change the score. Also, like, where is he driving? And maybe this is some staged, you know, staged event, closed course, paramedics on standby, or maybe this is active actual live traffic. What if he's going the wrong way down a one way road? Right? Like the context absolutely matters here, right? So it's really hard to just confidently say, hey, this is risky. This is a medium high risk without knowing more about it. And we'll never know everything we want to or need to know. And we make the best decisions that we can based on the information that we have. It doesn't mean we don't want to go try and learn more and incorporate that into our decision making. So I think we're done now. There's one more thing before we, we move on that I want to kind of bring up. Are, are you, think, think internally, look at, look at your mobile phone right now. Are you an Apple fan or do you just hate Apple? You know, it kind of how much maybe it doesn't change the risk factor here, but it definitely changes how 
much you care. What if you're Apple's biggest shareholder and you saw this? That's kind of both. You care and also changes the risk factor for you because what happens if something happens to Steve Jobs, right? And, you know, like I said, what if you're an Android fan, a Microsoft fan? You'll think differently based on this other context. And this, I, I wanted to use a relatable example. That's why it was great having the image of Steve Jobs, but but let's make it personal. Like, what if it was your your child on this bike? What do you think differently? And it's to kind of have, you know, be facetious about it. What if it was your favorite child, right? Like the the individual writing, the bike itself, there's so much more context that we we could use to answer the question on, is this risky? And this is what we'll use for today's presentation, kind of break this stuff down a little bit. But for right now, we've got we got another test. This is this is the final exam, by the way. So so do participate if you still have your chat up. Is this vulnerability risky? This is my fictitious CVE from 2022. All you know about it is the CVSS score is 9.0. Any any takers on yes, I don't need to know more based on what I know. This is risky. All right, going once. Going twice, going three times. So it depends. We want to know context. And that's the point of today, right? It's breaking down this context and doing it in a relatable way so that, you know, we could think about it, but so that we can communicate this to our stakeholders that might not understand it. Think about that, you know, developer you had a fight about an application security finding because they didn't understand the context or that fought you because the security scanning tool didn't understand enough context before you sent it over. Think about the IT person that you've interacted with. Like context matters, maybe or maybe not, they're experts in security, but it's our, our role as security folks to help folks understand. So we're gonna talk about vulnerability risk. We're gonna talk about asset risk, and we're gonna talk about being proactive versus reactive today. Probably have about maybe 20 minutes of content. Um, for all you guys, and then we'll open up to Q&A here at the end. So we're gonna do this framework of starting with the bike, the motorcycle, and then moving on to the, the vulnerability management side of the world. So let's start with the motorcycle. We talked a little bit about this. So my, my friends over at Geico have together a nice blog so that we can think about the technology advancements that are reducing the risk, increasing the safety of motorcycles. Anti-lock braking systems are a big one. So going back to the image earlier, we didn't talk about it, but you know, did the bike have ABS or did it not? And these are things that would matter, right? Does the bike have adaptive headlights? Well, maybe that matters like in theory or in concept, but I think I want more context there. If I think again about the image that I just showed you, it's in the middle of the day, he's going straight. <laughs> do, do I really care about adaptive headlights? Now, if, if I'm riding around at night, at dusk, at dawn on windy roads, then adaptive headlights would mean a lot more to me. They do a lot more for me. But knowing they exist, knowing how to correlate that with my behavior is important. And tires are always important. And motorcycles are twice as important is what I say because you only have two tires compared to a car that has four. You know, the ability to automatically shift for you, to communicate with other vehicles. Netting this all out, basically the risk context of the bike has to be considered when trying to answer the question, you know, is, it, is, motor, is riding a motorcycle risky? But now let's jump jump over to the other side of the world. So not every vulnerability has the same risk profile, right? I think this is becoming more common knowledge now than it was maybe a, a year or two or three ago, as far as the, the need to implement a risk-based vulnerability management program. Um, but here's a number for you. Does, does anybody happen to know how many vulnerabilities, kind of roughly speaking, um, there were CVEs in 2022? So when I look this up, it's about 25,000. When I then go look at CISA's known exploited vulnerability list, that list is about 1,000 vulnerabilities long. So statistically, you know, I know this isn't great math, but back of the envelope, there's about a 4% chance that you know, said CVE has, has been exploited. But asking the question, right? So, so I'm not trying to be just prescriptive on you know, how much more uh, risky is it because it's been exploited or not, but merely a question of, are we incorporating uh, exploitation likelihood or exploitation history in our prioritization mechanisms for vulnerabilities? Are we enriching the base CVSS scores with exploitation data? 
And are we correlating a lot of times uh, today, large enterprises, um, enterprises, small, medium enterprises have some sort of threat intelligence feeds as well. Uh, whether you're using something from, you know, the, the, the government or open source or, or you know, kind of uh, out of the box um, and available to you or, you know, something commercial like, uh, you know, Mandy and Record Future, you know, something like that. It's what good does it do you when it's over off into an island? You really want to correlate that with all your vulnerabilities. Um, and typically in security, we talk about, you know, it's always more risky, more risk, more risk, more risk, but there's a lot of stuff being done to mitigate the risk or have compensating controls or preventive, preventative measures, measures that don't necessarily solve the immediate problem, the actual risk, but they help reduce the, the blast radius, the likelihood of it. So some popular ones, you know, are you segmenting your networks? Is it behind multi-factor authentication? And the hard part here is, you know, for, for one vulnerability, if you just had one vulnerability and you could you could brute force this and just kind of correlate the other context that you have. When you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of vulnerabilities, it becomes a technology problem to solve for something that we conceptually know is the right thing to do. And so netting it out, CVSS isn't, isn't enough. And a vendor score isn't enough because you in your organization will have the personalization context for what matters for you for effective risk scoring. And before we kind of jump into asset criticality, let's jump back out to the uh, the motorcycle analogy. It's not every rider has the same risk profile, right? And the, the game's actually uh, a lot harder uh, than it seems because this is my list of top, you know, personal protective equipment for, for a motorcycle. This is actually a prioritized list. I put a lot of thought into this. Um, but here's a real question. How, how many of you all have infinity unlimited security budgets? And how many of your executive team board know enough about security to just give you more budget because they understand why having protective equipment, so to speak, matters? So, so really, it's if I could only afford three, what would I give up? And this is, this is actually my list. Like I said, I put a lot of thought into it. I don't think there's a right or wrong here. You could never convince me to give up the helmet. It's like the number one thing on my list every time. But then you can see there's some redundancies, right? So if I say, okay, let me go on the other side of that. Like, do, do I need a jacket? Well, yes, I, I definitely want a jacket. Don't get me wrong. But I think if I have a back and spine protector and a chest protector and a helmet, I, I wouldn't say I feel good about it, but I feel better about the fact that I don't have the jacket, right? If I have knee guards and boots, I feel better about the fact that I don't have the protective pants on. So I just, I just want coverage, however I can get it. And what we're seeing is more and more cybersecurity programs are getting mature enough to adopt these different forms of protection, but making sense of now that I have this all, where is the risk is getting to be a harder problem. And the risk context of the rider really needs to be considered. So let's take a step back even from the equipment. You know, if it was me riding a motorcycle versus Steve Jobs riding a motorcycle, let's use the example earlier. Like, who do you care more about? <laughs> who matters more? I mean, even me, probably, you know, I'm the only one, me, my close friends and my family that care that it's me that's riding the motorcycle unprotected. Everyone else, Steve Jobs will impact their lives more. And so let's bring this back to the vulnerability management side. So not every asset has the same risk profile, right? And there's different factors. At Brinko, we call them risk factors uh, to consider regarding those systems that, you know, the vulnerabilities reside on. You know, some of the the highest level, you know, is is that server is that system is it part of your flagship product line you know the money maker for your business or is it part of some skunk works project now let's not even get into the weeds of how everything's inter interconnected now is actually a really complicated problem but just at the highest level does your executive team know the level of risk tied to its biggest revenue generating product that is one way to, to get more security investment and more attention on security and tie it to how folks are making their money. Um, alternatively, and everyone knows this, so preach to the choir, um, is it subjective to compliance requirements that there'll be a financial or otherwise negative impact to your organization, preventing business? So, you know, is, is the server subject to HIPAA or PCI compliance or some other regulation? What kind of data does it store and process? Is it personally identifiable information? You know, is it internet facing or is this on a local machine? Like all this matters. And again, it matters because there's not enough resources to go around to do everything that you need to do on everything that you need to do it for. 
And without the context, you really never know your real risk. It's kind of like, like, like guessing a little bit. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. We talked about why context matters. Talked a little bit more tactically about the vulnerabilities themselves, the assets themselves. I want to talk a little bit more operationally now, like actually riding the motorcycle, actually doing vulnerability management. What do these things have in common? So let's go back out to the motorcycle example. So sometimes motorcycles race on tracks. Other, other vehicles race on tracks too. Go-karts, bicycles, marathon runners, <laughs> cars, F1 cars. But the thing is, the track, the circuit, is functionally the same for all those riders and vehicles. Different skill levels, different vehicles, different lap times. There's different nuances there, but functionally, they're going around the same track. And bonus points, by the way, there's no like secret reward or anything, just, just kudos from me. If you, if you know what track this is, uh, if you need a hint, um, I'm located in Austin, Texas, and that's the most hint you're going to get, but here's the point. The point is that you get a lot of different individuals going around functionally the same racetrack. So why do I bring this up? So a lot of security teams are following functionally a very, very similar process. Brinko, we call it the cyber risk life cycle. You might've heard as the vulnerability, uh, management life cycle or the remediation life cycle. You know, different names for different things, but at the end of the day, to be able to inventory, you know, the, the vulnerabilities, you know, the, the, the associated assets, prioritize those risks. I'm not saying it's good prioritization, it's the fact that it's prioritization. It still counts as prioritization. You take the top 25 as a tool gives you. It can be better, but you're still doing it. Something has to get done first. Remediating it, actually handing that over to the patching teams, the remediation teams, again, could be automated, could be manual but you're still looking to, to remediate it and then to report on it, to communicate the outcome, the progress. So this cycle is essentially that, that track that I was showing you earlier, right? The, the, the challenge here is for vulnerability management. It's something that everyone is doing, but, but much, much, much less are doing intentionally um, in a more standardized way. And what I mean by that is think about how we got here, right? So I have my vulnerability assessment tool. So, I mean, all the vulnerability is tied to, you know, all my hosts and servers. And that was one source of telemetry that I had to worry about. And so I applied this life cycle on top of that. But then what happened? Well, it turns out that containers are a thing and I've got a different tool surfacing that information. So I'm getting all that information. I'm going through the same, running the same laps. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, it turns out like application security is a thing and shifting left, who, who would have thunk it as a thing too? Now I've got SAST results, I've got SCA results, I've got infrastructure as code results. They're all coming from different tools, different programs now, but everyone in the organization is functionally doing the same work as opposed to standardizing across the, the enterprise. So the big takeaway here, think of it as a track. It's functionally the same. It's just a technology problem to get the right data in. But think about unifying your processes, your vulnerability management programs to get some economies of scale in a world where, where sca scarcity is essentially kind of, you know, just par for the course. I'm going to talk about one more thing, and then I'm going to, I'm going to get to, to, to a new approach that we're, we're talking about at Brinka. But let's, let's jump onto the kind of proactive versus reactive motorcycle ma risk management um, category right now. I'm pretty sure Gartner is going to coin this term in the next year. They're going to steal it from me, motorcycle risk management. So essentially you've got being proactive and being reactive. And there's an important thing I want to kind of call out here because I feel like often when these two terms are used together, there's a connotation that proactive is better. And I don't, I don't want to say that. What I want to say is you need both. If you're too reliant on reactive, it's just, we're going to talk about this picture, but do I really want my response, my safety net to just, I'm going to trust my airbag every time and I'm going to go crash into things? No, but I still want the airbag, right? So it's not one or the other, it's both. And it's both because what you're protecting matters. So let's talk about proactive safety. So, so what's that like on the motorcycle? It's, hey, practicing good driving habits. It's obeying traffic laws, defensive driving, right? You assume that other cars on the road don't see you. 
And that's what you do to avoid the need. And by the way, it's important, the need to rely on, you know, your airbag clothing, which is a thing, by the way, for those of you not familiar with, with motorcycles, um, there's a lot of really cool tech that, you know, your, your vest, for example, will auto detect an impact <clears throat> or the fact that you're about to, to collide with something and then inflate. But you're trying to protect your life. You're trying to protect your brain. You're trying to protect your legs. Um, so what you're protecting matters. You really need to do both. And here's the thing, being more proactive, it reduces the chances of needing to react to an incident. There's a, there's a connection between these two things. So now I'll bring this back to vulnerability management. This is um, something that's near and dear to, to Brinka's heart based on what our customers are trying to do. So think of this as a new proactive approach to managing exposures pre-attack. So to put together what we've talked about earlier, um, take all your exposures all the, all the telemetry you have from your security findings from across your enterprise, your infrastructure program, your cloud program, your CSPM findings, your application security program, you know, your SaaS, DAS, your SCA, and putting that all in one place so you could practice very intentionally plugging in threat context, plugging in business context, and correlating all that stuff into one central place and creating a consistent risk score so that you can just do what we talked about earlier in practice. So you could do risk-based prioritization. So you could proactively mitigate the biggest risks that you see. You could identify the reasons that they're risks. You could document it and it'll prevent, reduce, or otherwise impact in a good way, the level of effort on your threat detection incident response side. So for those of you more familiar with the security operations side of the world, um, those of you working kind of like, you know, a SOC, you know, just to help you understand, a SIM tool, for example, will take in a lot of your, your data from these different sources, but that data is in the form of events, logs, and alerts. You can't really take the log and then understand all this different context around it versus taking the security finding itself um, on the risk operation side of the world. And there's one more thing I want to talk about, about why being proactive matters because it's not just about reducing disruptions caused by incidents. It's about controlling them. So when we think being proactive versus reactive, my go-to analogy, is, it's just like brushing your teeth. Look, I brush my teeth every day because I don't want to have a root canal. Just because I brush my teeth every day doesn't mean I'm not going to have a root canal, but it's going to lower my risk. And by going to the dentist, brushing your teeth, practicing those good habits, I can kind of see that root canal coming. I could get ahead of it. I can control it. So what I mean by that, there's a difference between getting in a motorcycle accident on your week off, you got nothing else going on near a hospital, <laughs> hopefully, or getting into a motorcycle accident on the way to your favorite child's wedding. So you really want to not just avoid the disruption to the extent that you can. You also want to be able to control it to the extent that you can. And the way you could do that, or you can improve the likelihood that good luck follows you as opposed to bad luck is to pre precisely focus on the risks that matter most to your business. And what you, what you kind of seek to, or, or will achieve by doing this, is you're going to reduce risk, you're going to enhance efficiency and increase credibility with your stakeholders. Because remember how we started this, right? This wasn't an analogy just for fun. So an analogy so that you know, we can go to the, you know, the general management, uh, the general manager of business unit A and have this conversation, go to the risk committee that the board has formed um, for, you know, if you're at a publicly traded company, you know, sort of reacting to the new SEC regulations that are coming. It's how, how do you as a security team, as security leaders, communicate to your non-security stakeholders to justify being more proactive when they don't understand for the most part what in the world CVE 2022-99999 is. They don't know that's fictitious, right? So how do we communicate this in a stronger way for them? And that's what today was about. Like I said, hopefully we we also shared some interesting insights on doing risk-based vulnerability management in the process. That's what we have for today. Let me do a couple of call-ups and we'll open it up to Q&A. I see there's some, question, or there's, there's some comments in the chat that I'll catch up on in a second. But, but here are the takeaways, right? So... Visit Brinka.com if you want to learn more. Uh, like I said, we weren't going to focus on the technology today, but for those of you that kind of see the problem or familiar with the problem, you'll see there's a big technology aspect to actually implementing this for real. Um, if you're 
actively trying to do something like we're talking today, if you're planning for 2024, you know, you want some, some help from some SMEs on the Brinka side, you know, we live and breathe this stuff. QR code will take you to our homepage on our website, you know, check us out. I mentioned our customers earlier. So why is Brinka trying to solve this problem at this scale? It's for our customers. You know, not to get into the history of Brinka, but you know, you solve a problem well in the prioritization front for someone. They ask you to do more, and next thing you know, you know, you've become what we call a risk operations center, uh, you know, platform to support that vulnerability management program that's standardizing this across the enterprise. So, you know, this isn't our first rodeo. Reach out to us if you think we could help. And the last thing before we open up to Q&A, <clears throat> if you look at the bottom of this slide, and you heard Lauren say this, you heard me say it, here, here's a little bit of a secret Easter egg for those of you that are still um, listening in to us. So you see another QR code at the bottom and the words vroom, vroom. So that QR code, if you go to, we'll take it to Brinka's contact us page. If you submit a contact us form, and this is important, don't just submit the form or it won't count, listen. <laughs> and put in the words vroom vroom somewhere in there in your submission we have a limited supply of secret swag that we will send out to you we'll follow up with you after this webinar so if that sounds fun and interesting to you definitely you know don't delay uh, but that said if you have questions now is the time we'll open it up to questions and just before i take the first one let me catch up on the kind of chats and q and a part just to see okay yep thanks lauren so we'll use the q and a Function, not the chat. Looks like we're doing good. All right, I think I actually, <laughs> jokes aside, I need a little bit more context to answer this one. So how do you see risk and impact scaling against each other? It's from Anonymous. If this was your question, could you actually jump in and provide a little bit more explanation for me? Um, in, in the meantime, I'll, I'll kind of answer what I think it might be asking. Um, I'd say it this way. Let's use the motorcycle analogy, see if this will work in real time. Going around the track, like there's a purpose there. So, so my goal, if I'm racing a motorcycle around the track, is to go faster, is to complete the circuit, is to be better. My goal is not to be the safest. And this is a little bit of a subtlety, right? So let's take that. Why are we talking about that? On the business side, you know, we're talking risk and impact. The goal of the business is to make money, especially if it's publicly traded. You know, you've got got shareholders to answer to. Um, yes, there's a vision for the business, but it's not, hey, let's add in so much security and safety mechanisms to us prevent us from making money. So the real question, the real challenge is how do we um, balance kind of the uh, where the business wants to go, but not getting in what I would call dangerous territory. Right. And that's what's so hard and just, and, you know, balancing these like risk and impacts. It's helping folks at a, at the high level that don't understand security to just understand that. I'll give you just a, a quick example. I said, I didn't want to go into the technology too much here. There's a widget we have in a Brinka dashboard that summarizes all your, you know, quantity of vulnerabilities and also by severity by business line. So imagine you take that somewhere, right? Um, Brinka could show the data. And can slice and dice the data. Hey, product line one has five times more vulnerabilities, 10 times more of which are critical compared to product line two. And I don't need to be an expert in security to be on the business kind of executive team of that meeting to if product line one is more important to the business financially than product line two to figure out what's going on. <laughs> what, what are we doing in two that we are not doing in one? Why is this happening? Um, to again, kind of balance like level of risk and the impact of solving that problem. All right, we got another question. Does the risk-based Brinka score drive remediation SLAs for most customers? Example, if Brinka's critical risk apply company critical SLA. So really, really good question. Um, so we didn't get into that part of the, the story today. Um, so let's jump to it and let's do the two minute version. Um, Prioritization matters and severity matters because inevitably it does tie to, to SLAs. And so to answer the question directly, yes, Br Brinka, with Brinka, you'd actually correlate the, the kind of final risk score with the SLA and it would be documented. So in particular, think of extremes. I have a medium severity uh, finding from, let's say, a CVSS scoring point of view. 
but I've turned into a critical. Why does that matter? Why does that raise flags? Why does that cause problems? It's because now I went and sent that to IT or dev to remediate. And they might think I'm sandbagging. Hey, it's a medium. Why do I need to get this done in one week? Because that's my critical SLA. That's why this matters. And that's why being transparent about it matters. And that's why documenting this stuff at scale is difficult. Um, I'd say like usually what happens from like, uh, you know, why does someone buy Brinka? Well, there's some red teaming exercise. There's an audit that exposes the fact. And there's a lot of research on this now too, that medium and high severities are the ones that are actually being exploited. So if you burn all your resources, all your, all your kind of political capital, all the trust you have with your mediation teams, you know, on all these so-called criticals, it turns out if you contextualize them further, they weren't critical. So that's one way to reduce a big, massive backlog, by the way, just make it more accurate. Um, but then you still need a whole backlog's worth of these mediums and highs that are actually now reprioritized into critical. So, so it's like, don't delay. But the SLA is such a big part. And I'm going to actually extend beyond the question here. It's not just the SLA. It's not just the remediation. It's being able to report on that progress, right? So it inevitably turns into a report. How are we doing according to those SLAs? You know, so in, in Brinka, I know I know one of our kind of large enterprise customers, the, the, the dashboard that they like, and this is going to be personal for you, but they use in Brinka is they want to know, what are my critical vulnerabilities that are out of SLA? He's already done the work to contextualize and trust his criticals. And he's already done the work of mapping these to SLAs and tracking them. So he wants a report. So when he wakes up every day, that's the biggest known actionable risk that he sees across infrastructure application and cloud security. All right, we've got, got one more question. Um, let's see what it says. Oftentimes when a high priority risk is identified, multiple teams need to be involved for mitigation in a distributed environment. How do you understand who owns what and what SLAs they could stand behind? All right, so this is th definitely we need to follow up because um, details are gonna matter here. So I'll give you the kind of broad strokes answer. Um, How do I say this? Chances are you're not starting from scratch as far as identifying owners, but chances are there's a lot of room for improvement. So, so I'll explain this. Just, I think it'll help for the concept to how, how Brinka kind of helps solve this problem is think you've got your CMDB, you've got your asset criticality list, you've got your asset ownership list. These are other sources of data that are silo typically from the tool used to actually detect the vulnerability. So from a Brinka perspective, think, think of Brinka as a, as a graph database that's pulling in and built to pull in these data, these, this data from different sources. So your, your vulnerability assessment findings and your business context data, and then stitch this stuff together so you can keep track of it. So what's going to happen over time is some of it's going to be actionable. Some of it's just going to expose gaps of information and bad information. And this is where the world's a little really tricky right now as far as who, who owns that problem, the CMDB. I, I hear from a lot of security folks, vulnerability management teams in particular, they don't want to own it. But that doesn't mean that they don't want to collaborate with it. And the interesting thing about having all these detection tools in place is they're essentially exposing not just the, like, forget the owners for a second, just assets that exist. How do you know it exists? So it's not on any list. It's not in any CMDB. It's not accounted for anywhere. But I know because I'm on the security side that there's an asset there because there's a vulnerability that was detected on said asset. So I think collaborating and building the relationship and the uh, kind of bridge between, in this case, like I say, most commonly I see is like IT and, and security in this case. And obviously like, like roles and responsibilities will change based on, on where you are. All right. So unless there's any other questions, I'll give it... Five seconds to pop into the Q&A. I think that probably covers it for today. Really appreciate the participation this morning. I, I, I hope you enjoyed the session. And part of that, I hope, is because of me. But I hope a lot of it is also because you all participated. You got to see you're not alone in this, right? Like other folks like yourselves are, are thinking similar ways and how subjective this really is and how challenging this is. All right. Going once. Going twice. All right, sold. Lauren, why don't you close us out? Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Uh, to echo that, we hope you all had a really great time. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We'll give you a couple of minutes back to enjoy the rest of your day. Please feel free. Again, those QR codes are still up. You still have a little bit of time. Uh, otherwise, thank you all. That is all we've got for you today. We will talk to you soon. Thank you again. 
Thanks, everyone.